Hey there, team! Chemistry Coach coming at you again with the, you know, sibling of accuracy, precision. We got to make sure that we qualitatively understand the difference between accuracy and precision and what we use them for in the laboratory. So remember, accuracy was, did you hit the bullseye? How close was your value or average of multiple values of an experiment to the true value? Or if you're shooting archery or darts or whatever, did you hit the bullseye at? or whatever you're aiming at? Precision's a whole different ballpark, okay? Precision um, is how close multiple runs are to each other. So say you're measuring the, you know, the uh, concentration, determining the concentration of an unknown base, and you do four measurements on that. And they're all scattered all over the place. That's not precise. Yeah. And that implies a lack of technique or something wrong with your technique. So if you're scattered all over the place, I don't have a lot of confidence in your skill. If you're very precise though, that gives me confidence in your skill. So you can think of precision as, as confidence in your skill, but we still have to worry about what's called systematic error. Right? So how close multiple runs are to each other is precision. Right, repeatability, repetition, whatever words you want to use. Uh, if you're into uh, shooting guns or archery or something, clustering, right? So you're like, if you're shooting, poop, 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 can you cluster them real close to each other? If you're shooting arrows or throwing knives, are they all clustered in the same spot? That's precision. Doesn't necessarily mean they're all clustered in the bullseye. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? You can be precisely inaccurate if there's some kind of systematic error. Like I said, if I'm shooting archery and the wind's blowing to my left, I may be doing everything correctly technique-wise, but my arrows are swaying slightly to the left because of the wind. So I'm consistently, you can think of consistency here as well. Repetition, repeatability, consistency. I'm consistently hitting, say, you know, five inches to the left of the bullseye. But my arrows are hitting relatively close to each other. I'm like, I'm precise, but I'm not accurate. So that implies a systematic error, right? So precision doesn't always mean you're accurate. That's why I like to give you practice unknowns to see if you're if you're not precise, we got to work on your technique. There's probably three or four flaws in your technique. Once we fix that and we get you precise, we can compare your value to an unknown value, a known unknown. And if you're consistently low, precisely low or precisely high, then we know there's some kind of systematic error going on and we can find that and get rid of that until you can be precise and accurate. So what I'm going to be doing in lab is having you practice on a known unknown for no points, right? I'm not going to penalize you for practicing. Um, just like when I'm coaching, I don't penalize my athletes for practicing. I want them to come screw up. Well, I ideally don't screw up, but they're going to. So I can help them with their techniques so they do better in the game. That's no different from lab. Come. I don't care if you screw up. I can fix your technique so that you do well during the championship game, which is like the big unknown or something. Right? Um, so once we get rid of the systematic error uh, and you can say, hey, you're precise and accurate with a known value, then we'll move on to the big unknown. We both have confidence in your skills. So precision is a measure of confidence. Right? Um, normally you're doing multiple runs, so our reference point is going to be the average. Since we, we don't care in precision at this point where we're measuring precision, we don't care if you're accurate at this point. So the true values are relevant. Our reference point is the average. So say you do four, four runs or five runs and we do the average value. I want to know how close each each of those individual runs are to that average value. And the closer each one is, the smaller your cluster is, right? So if you're really precise, say you're shooting arrows or something, they're all clustered in this small circle, right? But if you're if you're scattered and your technique's all over the place, you need a big circle to encompass all your arrows. You might be even missing the target, right? So we want to get that circle, that cluster, small as we can so all your arrows are hitting in a small spot. And if you're like Robin Hood, an arrow hits and the next arrow, arrow hits the prior arrow. That's like almost perfect precision, right? Hitting that same spot over and over. That's not gonna happen in lab. You do four runs on like an unknown. It's very, very, very rare. I'm not ever gonna say impossible, but exceedingly rare that all your runs are exactly the same out to all the non-significant digits. I've never seen that happen. Right? If I do see that happen, I'll be like, yeah, let's check. Let, let coach watch you do one, and I guarantee you when you do that one I'm watching, it's not going to be close to the other ones. <gasps> 
that implies something not good. <laughs> All right. So let's take a look at how we uh, uh, express precision while my neighbor finishes mowing their lawn. <laughs> All right, three ways we are going to express precision. And we're gonna use what's called deviation. For accuracy, we mathematically express that using error. For deviation, we're gonna mathematically express that using this concept called deviation D. And just like we had a couple types of error, we had absolute error and relative error, we're actually gonna have three types of deviation. We're gonna have absolute deviation, Relative deviation, which mimics what we did with error, absolute and relative error. We'll have absolute deviation and relative deviation. Relative meaning we divide by something. And then what I'm going to have you calculate most of the time is called RAD, relative average deviation from the mean. <clears throat> it's a mouthful of statistics right there, and we'll go through it and show you how to do it. But I want to get this concept across of precision versus accuracy. So anyway, let's call the absolute deviation just D with absolute value bar. So it's always going to be a positive value. And similar to error, with error, we took the true value minus the uh, your run or average of your runs. Right? Well, here, we don't care about the true value. That's irrelevant. So we're going to have several different runs. So let's say, for example, you know, we're, uh, you know, we're shooting arrows or, or whatever. And we hit here. Let's say that's the first shot. Second shot is here. And third shot is there. Boom, boom, boom. Or maybe you do three three runs on the density of an unknown. You get three different values with that kind of spread. Right? We could set we could look at the difference between run A and B. I could just subtract those. That would be the deviation between A and B, right? Or I could do the deviation between A and C or C and B. So normally we're not going to do that. So it's very rare in my class we're going to look at the deviation between two individual runs. We're interested in the average, right? So if I average these. That would be somewhere around here. If that's our average. So let's define X bar as our average. So let's say it falls there. Now we have a reference point. So the reference point for uh, accuracy and error is the true value. The reference point for precision and deviation is the average of multiple runs. How close are they to? And the closer they are, the tighter the circle, right? So what I can do now is I can look at this and go, well, I can look at the difference between the average and run A. So if I look at that, that's the deviation of run A. And if I do this one, I can look at the difference between run B and the average. That's the deviation of run B from the average. I can do the same thing with C, correct? So I can look at this and go, well, how far is run C from the average? So that's the deviation of C. So the number of runs you have, if you had eight runs of an experiment, you'd have eight deviations from the mean. So we're going to focus on these ones right here. So the deviation of the mean from run one, deviation from run two, et cetera, et cetera. That's what we call the absolute deviation. If it's negative, make it positive. You're subtracting, so you're limited by largest absolute certainty, a.k.a. fewest number of decimal places. Now, I'm going to draw a pictorial view of uh, precision and accuracy um, using targets. Let's take a look at these so we really qualitatively grasp what's going on. We've got four different targets here, and let's show you the different types of combinations of precision and accuracy so you can get a grasp pictorially of what's going on. So let's say you're shooting some darts at a Christmas party and you've had a few too many, um, you know, spiked eggnogs or something. <laughs> or you've never played, you're like, I'm just chucking darts, you know, hit the keg. <laughs> so poor precision and poor accuracy. So which means you're doing, let's say you throw three darts. They're not even close to each other. Hopefully you hit the target. And they're not even close to the bullseye. Remember, we're shooting for the bullseye. That would be accurate. So let's say you hit here. You know, shot A is over here. Let's say shot B is over here and you miss the target. You're like, oh man, and shot C is over this way. They're not close to each other and they're not even close to the target. The average would be, you know, right about there. So that's no good. So poor precision, they're not clustered together, and poor accuracy. Well, let's say we had good precision but poor accuracy. So you're like, hey, whoa, sure. And you keep hitting 
over to the left. We got some systematic error. Maybe you're like me, you got a bad shoulder and you're like, oh, oh, oh. So they keep going down, right? So I'm consistently hitting down below. So let's say I hit here, there, and there, right? Pretty consistent, but consistently bad, <laughs> right? Consistently inaccurate. So I didn't hit the bullseye. Average is right around there, but I'm consistent about it. So I can go, ah, it's my busted up shoulder. I'm good. You know, I'm out of here. I'm going to go watch a you know football game or something like that. But in lab, if I see this kind of behavior, I can I know that's a systematic error. I can fix that. I go, there's probably one main reason. If you're scattered all over the place like this and not accurate, there's probably two, three, or four flaws in your technique. It's going to take a while to fix that. Or you're just being sloppy and not care or trying to rush your way through it. Don't ever rush chemistry. All right, in lab, that's how, you know, things go break, smash, boom. Um, but this would be, oh, I can tell you're taking care, you're doing well, you're not being sloppy or rushing it, but there's just one consistent thing. Maybe a burette, you're reading it upside down or something. Maybe you got some bubbles in your tubing uh, if you're doing, uh, you know, uh, titrations or whatever. Not conditioning properly. You know, there's a lot of reasons for it. So this would be one, and I put the blue star neck. This is what we're after. Uh, the practice, we want to get the practice to get this. Good precision, you're consistent, your cluster is tight, and good accuracy. So you're hitting right around here. So you're hitting here, right? So you got your three shots. The average is pretty close to the center. Good deal. That's what we like. That's what you want to do to get a 50 out of 50 on your unknown, right? Now, I, this doesn't happen much. Normally, I don't you let you even do an unknown unless you're, you, you can show some kind of, I wouldn't let you do an unknown with that kind of precision. No way. But if I see you're precise and we can fix a systematic error, I'm probably going to let you move on to an unknown. But let's say your precision is poor. So just, I just, you're having a bad day. Something goes wrong. And your first runs here. Your second is over here. And your third is there. You've got pretty bad precision. See that? But what would the average be? Pretty close to the bullseye, wouldn't it? That's called luck. <laughs> we don't, I don't want you getting a good... I would be forced to give you a good grade on accuracy, but not on precision. I'd be like, you got lucky today. The chem gods are on your side. Yay, Bohr. Yay, Heisenberg, right? But it's exceedingly rare that people get very poor precision and their techniques all over the place. But it just happens to be that the average of those imprecise runs happens to fall pretty close to the true value. Yay! So I'm going to put a big no-no on that one. We don't want to do that one. This is the one we want. So you get a feel for precision versus accuracy? Right on. Let me show you the other two ways to express um, precision via deviation. We did absolute deviation. Let's look at relative deviation next. In, in literally the exact same fashion as we did absolute and relative error, right, for accuracy, we have absolute and relative deviation for precision. So with relative deviation, we're going to scale the absolute deviation by the reference point, which is the average in this case, right? The, the true values are relevant for precision. So what we're going to do is we're going to scale it or divide it by the average of all of your runs. So for example, let's, we, let's say we want to do the, what's the relative deviation for run A or run number one. Well, let's take the average value minus run one or run A. That's the devi absolute deviation of run A. Let's scale it or divide it by a reference point, which is the average. We're going to treat average and mean as the same here, to be simple. That gives you a ratio. That's unitless. Units cancel out. Um, and then to get percent relative deviation, we times that by 100. If we take that, that ratio and convert it right into a percent, percents parts per 100. Or if it's a technique that I feel should give you better consistency or better precision, I'll have you multiply that by 1,000 to get PPT or parts per 1,000. Another fumble. Gravity must be pulling strong right here in my chair. So parts, just like we did for error. That's parts per 1,000. Now, if you're at a major university with some very expensive techniques, you might be doing PPM, multiplied by a million to get parts per million relative error. Same with accuracy. You could do parts per million um, as far as the accuracy. 
Um, you can do it accuracy or deviation. You can multiply by a trillion or a billion, depending on how much money you're willing to spend on technique. Hey, right on. So let's look at the next one. It's a RAD, or Relative Average Deviation from the Mean. That's what I'm going to have you calculate statistically. You're taking your data. You, gotta, you, you can't get away from statistics. You have data sets in lab. When you have data sets, you can do statistics on it. Oh, you can't get away from it. So let's do the next one, which is what I'm going to have you calculate as a way to measure the confidence in your skills for a particular technique. All right, the lawnmower finally stopped. <laughs> Here we go. Hopefully you didn't hear that in the background. So number three, I'm going to put a star next to this. This is what I'm going to have. If I say, hey, how confident are you in your technique? I'll, get, I'll say, or if you say, hey, professor, professor, how, how's my technique, my skill? I'll say, what's your rad? How rad are you? How rad are you? Now, the problem is the more rad you are, Rad is bad. Okay, the bigger your rad, the bigger your cluster, right? The smaller your rad. Think of rad as a mathematical way to express the circle that encompasses the spread of your data. So if you're all over the place, you've got to, to draw a circle around it. You need this big circle. That's big rad. That's bad. But if your values are very close, boop, and you got this little tiny circle that encompasses them all, that's low rad, which is super good. So I'm so not rad that's in lab. I'm so totally not rad. That's a good thing. I'll be like, high five, high five. Let's do your unknown. This is a mouthful. Rad, relative average deviation from the mean. Blah, statistics, yuckiness. What we're going to do is we're going to work this backwards, right? To give The only way I can really express it is how big is the circle to encompass the spread of your data. The smaller is the better. Let's work it, in, and to track the uncertainty, we got to do this in four steps. So let's say we have some data points here. All right, so let's say I have uh, my first run A, right? Let's say we have my second B, and then C is right there. First thing we want to do is calculate the mean, right? We're going to, you know, overlap mean and average with this. So. If we did that, that would be maybe right here. Everybody agree? Let me move C a little further away here so I can put a little sign there. So there's our, there's our values. We'll make it nice and symmetric. So we got three runs, for example, and let's say the average is there. So let's calculate the mean first. The mean of all runs. Let's call that X bar. We good? We good? So just take A plus B plus C, divide by three, you're good to go. If you had five runs, add them together, divide by five. No big deal. Now let's look at step two. Work it backwards. Can we calculate the deviation of each run from the mean? Yeah. So we're going to calculate the absolute deviation of each run from the mean. It's all statistics. This ain't even chemistry. This is just statistics. Okay, and that's just your remember your equation. Let's use this. So that's just, uh, so we have like deviation of A is X bar minus A, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we can do that here. And we showed this picture before. So this would be the deviation of A, the deviation of B, and the deviation of C, right? Subtract those, subtract those. So if you had five runs, you'd have five values. Each run, boop, that's the longest step right there. All right, let's look at step three. What's next? Can you average those deviations? So if I had three deviations, could I add them all together and divide by three? Heck yeah, right? So we're going to average all deviations. So we're going to average all of the absolute deviations. So take the deviation of run A from the mean, 
deviation of run B from the mean, deviation of run C from the mean, add them together, divide by three. Not too bad. Now let's look at step four. And we're doing this to track uncertainty. Can you make that relative by dividing by the reference point, which is the mean or average, right? So we're going to make it relative. Now, let's, let's just do the step there. So let's make it relative. So we're going to divide by the uh, mean. So if I did an equation for this, um, let's squish this down here. So rad, this is going to be fun. You ready for all these bars here? We're taking the average deviation from the mean. You ready? So here's the deviations. There's your average deviation. We're going to average all the deviations from the mean, right? So that bar over it. And then we're going to divide, make it relative by the mean. Well, that just looks like a bowl of Cheerios, doesn't it? <laughs> so take the average deviation from the mean divided by the mean. That's making it relative. Now, again, that's a ratio. So just like before, you can times it by 100. And you can times it by 1,000, depending on the technique. So if you times it by 100, right, which is, uh, I mean, uh, which is uh, percent, parts per 100, that gives you percent rad, and times it by a thousand, that gives you PPT rad, depending on the technique. Fun. We're going to do a calculation. It's going to take a little bit, but I'm only going to do one calculation ever for this. You ready? Get your calculators out. This is going to be tedious. All right, you'll be doing this in the lab, guys. Pretty much any time you have more than one run, I'm going to want to know how good your how confident we are in your skills. We'll say, what's your rad? Right? And I'll have a number that if you're below that number, I'm okay with you doing an unknown. If you're higher than that, I'll be like, let's practice some more. So let's say we're doing some uh, unknown solution, maybe an acid or base or something, and I'm going, hey, let's measure its concentration. Let's say you do three runs. You get 0 0.09550.89 molar, good to four significant figures. Sounds like we're standardizing something here, like a base. Uh, run two, or run A and B, right? 0 0.09556.25 molar, good to four significant figures. And let's say run three or run C is 0 0.095451.5 molar, also good to four significant digits. What is the PPT rad, or parts per thousand rad? So calculate rad, do the four steps, uh, and then take that ratio, multiply it by 1,000. That will give you PPT rad. I want you to pause it and give it a shot. Try to do all four steps. See if you can track the uncertainty properly. All right, so I'm going to pause it. Do step one real quick, which is the average, correct? So let's calculate the average. So I'm going to pause it, let you do it. I'll pop it up on the board, see if we get the same thing. Remember, average is... What's the rules for tracking a certainty for averages? going to drive you crazy. All right, so if the average I took, make sure you take the, uh, the non-rounded or intermediate values. Don't ever take the rounded value and move it through. And actually, I'm not going to round anything through all the steps until step four because I'm asking for the rad only. So I'm only going to round the rad when we're done with step four. I'm not going to round anything on the way up, right? Just a waste of time. So let's take run number one, run number two, run number three, add them all together, divide by three. Remember that three is exact, and when you're doing averages, you're limited with the same rules as addition. So we're limited by largest absolute certainty or fewest decimals. One, two, three, four, five decimals. Five decimals, five decimals. So my answer is going to be good to five decimals. So I just add those three together, divide by three, write it out to five decimal places. I get 0 0.0955076. Good to five decimal places, right? Carry those two non-significant digits. That's our average or mean. Let's do step two where we're going to calculate the deviate, the absolute deviation of each run, A, B, and C, from the mean. So we're going to take this mean minus run one 
we're going to take this mean minus run two and this mean minus run three or run a b c so we're going to get three of them do that for me real quick get the three deviations for runs one two three a b c one two three How'd you do for step two, gang? This is the hardest step. This one step takes as long as all the other ones combined. And the more runs you have, man, if you have eight runs, you're like, oh, man, I got to calculate eight absolute deviations. Blah. Normally in lab, if we have time, we'll do, you know, maybe four runs. If we can statistically eliminate an outlier, one that which one of these doesn't look like the other and keep your closest three. Typically, that's the case. So run two, calculate all absolute deviations from the mean. So let's take runs. You could do A, B, C, or one, two, three, however you want to do it. So let's take the deviation of run A. That's going to be the mean we calculated in step one minus the value for run A. So here's the mean or average we calculated, 0 0.09550076. Good to five decimals. This is all molarity. Notice I have units on everything. Let's subtract run one, 0 0.09550089 molar. Those are pretty close. So that gives me an absolute deviation of 0 0.00013 molar, good to five decimal places, leaves me with zero significant figures. Weird. They're really, really close, right? Those are almost on top of each other. Right. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean it's accurate. That just means it's close to the average. We don't know what the true value is, right? Right. So let's do the same thing for run B, 0 0.09550076. That's our, our mean, right? Minus 0 0.09556.25, all good to five decimals. That's our second run, run two or B. Subtract them, good to five decimals, 0 0.00005, vertical dash line, four nine. Right? End up with one significant figure there. Let's do the same thing for our third run or run C. Take the uh, average minus C, so 0 0.09550076. That was the average we calculated in step one. Minus 0 0.09495415 molar, good to five decimals. Leaves me 0 0.00005.61 molar, good to five decimals. Do you love statistics yet? Get used to it, friends. Now step C is pretty easy. Can you average these? The average, remember, we're doing the relative average deviation from the mean. Here's your three deviations from the mean. We've got this one, this one, and that one. Can you add those three? together and divide by three? Of course you can. Do that in step three while I erase this board. Did you get the mess I got? So we're going to calculate the average deviation from the mean. So we've got three deviations from the mean, right? Deviation of run A from the mean, deviation of run B from the mean, and deviation of run C from the mean. Let's add those together and divide by three. So take the answers from step two. There's a deviation of A, deviation of B, deviation of C. Add them all together, divide by 3. That 3 is exact, so we're limited by the addition part in the numerator. So says statistics people. So 5 decimals, 5 decimals, 5 decimals. I'm limited to 5 decimal places in my answer. I get 0 .00003.74 molar, good to 5 decimal places. Leaves me with one significant figure. Now, does that make sense? Well, yeah, it's, remember, your average, your mean, has to be lower than your biggest value going in and bigger than your lowest value. You should always check that. If that was less than the deviation of run A or greater than the deviation of run C, that wouldn't make any sense. You might have forgot to run by three. I need you to set up your calculations just like this in lab so that when you come up to get it checked, that's a lot. I'm not going to sit there for 10 minutes and do it for you. I can check your sig figs and all this kind of stuff, and I can see if there's a problem with it. And if you set up your work like this, it'll take me just a few seconds to go, boop, there it is right there. I right? forgot to divide by three, or you wrote that number twice or something. Be very explicit in your calculations, gang. Let's do step four. Let's take the average deviation from the mean. Step four, make it relative. Can you take that and divide it by our reference point, which is the mean, relative average deviation from the mean, times it by 1,000. You got it, guys. We're almost done. All right, we're at the finish line, gang. Sprint to the end. You can do it. Let's divide that step three by the mean. So let's take the average deviation from the mean we did in step three, divided by the mean from step one times 1,000. So there's our average deviation from the mean, 0 0.00003.74 molar, good to five decimal places. Divide by the mean from step one, 0 0.09550076 molar, good to four significant figures. Now we're dividing... So we're limited by fewest sig figs. We got one significant figure in our average deviation from the mean, four sig figs in our mean, 
that thousands exact leaves us with one significant figure at the very end, 0 0.391 parts per thousand, good to one sig fig. So that's closer to 0.4 to the 0.3, so it rounds up to 0.4 parts per thousand. Whew. Anything below one is usually pretty good. Anything below two for titrations and stuff is okay. But typically when we're using glasswork, I like to see that around 1 to 1.5, ideally below one. Statistics, baby, you got it.